Hello everybody, welcome back to Med School EU. My name is Andre and today we're going to be covering the fundamentals of inorganic chemistry. However, more specifically today we're going to start off with inorganic nomenclature. Well, nomenclature is simply naming from formulas or making formulas from names of inorganic compounds. So if, as an example, if we have NaCl, the name of this is going to be sodium chloride. So that is the nomenclature. So we're gonna go over the rules of nomenclature today, but more specifically inorganic. Later on, we are going to have a lecture on organic nomenclature, which is completely different from what we're doing today. So here, today we're going to discuss two types of naming. So inorganic nomenclature is going to be split between ionic bonding and covalent bonding. So as we discussed previously, ionic bonds are going to be between metals and non-metals, and covalent bonds are gonna be between two non-metals. So why am I bringing up this split between ionic and covalent bonds? Well, because the nomenclature, inorganic nomenclature is going to be different between ionic and covalent compounds. So we need to understand the difference. First, you need to identify, is this ionic or is this covalent? And from there on, we'll be able to go and do our naming of that compound. So first, let's discuss ionic compounds as they involve several nuances. So the naming for ionic compounds is going to be quite simple. You're just going to have your metal name then you're going to write your non-metal name as it specifies on the periodic table. However, you're going to also add an IDE ending to the non-metal. For example, if we have NaCl, as we mentioned, the name is going to be the metal, which is sodium, as it says on the periodic table, no changes there. Then it's chlorine. However, instead of writing chlorine, I-N-E, you're going to substitute the ending with I-D-E. And now you're gonna have sodium chloride. Another example would be K-I. So we have potassium as the metal. We just write potassium. And we have iodine, iodine as the non-metal. However, we know that we have to replace I-N-E with I-D-E and now we're gonna have iodide. Then we have uh, something like CaF2. Now the name of that is calcium, if we're looking at the periodic table, and the non-metal is gonna be fluorine, but it will become fluoride as the name changes to IDE. Now this stays pretty consistent throughout, so these are the very simple ones. Now if you're wondering why I have a two over here, uh, we are going to have to f now learn how to go backwards from the name backwards to the formula. And in order to understand that, we have to take a look at the periodic table of elements. So in order to understand how to go from the name to the formula, we have to understand charges, charges of different groups on the periodic table. This is something that we've discussed previously on in another video, and I'm going to link that right up here so you can check that out if you haven't seen it yet. That knowledge is required in order to understand the rest of today's lecture. So here, what we have is we're just going to show the charges of the common groups, and I'm not going to explain how they happen. You will have to check out that video that I made previously, just for the sake of time. Here we have a plus one charge on the first group, plus two charge on the second group. Transition metals are going to be multivalent, which we are going to talk about a little bit later. The third is going to be plus three. Here we'll have plus four or minus four, depending on uh, the situation. Then for the non-metals, starting with nitrogen and phosphorus here, we're gonna have minus three oxygen, sulfur, selenium, negative two, and the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, are gonna be negative one charge. And of course, the noble gases do not have a charge. So these are the charges that we should know if we want to make the formulas. So let's take a look at some examples. So if I have magnesium chloride, 
what we're going to do in order to make the formula is we're going to do a crisscross method. So we're going to write out the ions for each of the elements. So magnesium is right there. So its ion is going to be two plus and chlorine is right there. So its ion is going to be minus one. Now, all we're going to do is we're going to crisscross. The negative one charge will go down as a subscript for magnesium and the two is going to go down as a subscript for chlorine. So therefore, our final formula is going to be Mg1, but we're not going to write a subscript of one, Cl2. So we're going to include all the subscripts except one. We just assume one is obviously there. So what this really means is I have one atom of magnesium and I have two atoms of chlorine in one compound of magnesium chloride. Next, let's do lithium oxide. Lithium is right here, element number three. So it's going to have a plus charge and oxygen is going to have a two minus charge. If you crisscross them, we're going to get Li2O. And another example, we have potassium phosphide. So here, if we are gonna do the ions, potassium is K plus and the ion of phosphorus is P3 minus. When we crisscross, we're going to get K3P. Now remember, I mentioned that ionic compounds nomenclature is gonna have a couple of nuance, meaning there's a couple of strange cases. So the first strange case is going to be with the transition metals. So the transition metals are right here on the periodic table. So it's this block of, of these elements. And the reason why they're going to have a nuance is because some of them are multivalent. And multivalent means they're going to have multiple charges. So for example, something like iron could be iron two plus or iron three plus. Another common one is copper two plus or copper just plus. Or we could have a lead PB two plus, or we could have lead four plus. So when we are encountering the situation and somebody says, okay, we, we've got iron oxide. We don't really know what the formula is because we don't know which iron you're talking about. So we have a problem with this nomenclature, the, the rules that we have used so far, because if I just put down iron oxide, I don't know what the formula will be since I don't know which ion where I'm using. So in order to uh, omit this problem, there is a scheme to do so. For example, if I am talking about Fe2O3, so this is my formula and I want to do the name of this, I would have to indicate how, what is the ion for the, the iron. So here, if we split these backwards, if we do the crisscross backwards, Fe is going to be three plus because the three is now gonna go up here. And oxygen is of course two minus and that's not gonna change because oxygen is not multivalent. So it is going to be the iron with three plus charge. In this case, we're gonna to have to write iron and we're gonna put three Roman numerals in brackets to indicate that it's iron three and here we're going to have our oxide. So the rest of the naming is going to be exactly the same. Another example will be FeO and the name of this. So since we're going to have Fe2 plus and O2 minus, I'm going to explain why there's no subscripts here. You might be wondering like, hey, what's going on? We should have some sort of subscripts two and two. However, we don't put the subscripts because they're simply going to cancel out. So if we have four and two, well, that's gonna cancel out and this will just be two. So these charges are going to be cancelable. Therefore, our subscripts will remain as one and one. Now for that case, we still have to indicate which iron it is. We do not have iron one and we do not have oxygen with a negative charge. We have oxygen with two negative charge. So in this case, we would have to indicate this iron, which will be iron and Roman numerals two oxide. And that's the name of FeO. 
Another prominent example of cancellations is going to be here with PBS2. So as I mentioned earlier, lead, which is right here, is also multivalent and it could be lead 4 plus or lead 2 plus. And in this case, we know that sulfur is minus 2 since sulfur is right there. And since this is the arrangement, I know that lead is 4 plus and I'm going to explain a little bit how that works. Again, we're going to have the cancellation since it's 4 and 2 and these both divide by 2. This becomes 2 and this becomes 1. So the 2 goes here and the 1 goes there and that's why we have this sort of arrangement. So we still have to indicate that this is lead 4 plus. So we will write lead, Roman numerals 4, sulfide is going to be the name of this compound. Moving on to the second nuance, and this is going to have to deal with polyatomic ions. You might be wondering what polyatomic ions are. Well, poly means many, atomic means atoms, so many atoms, ions. So typically when we talk about ions previously, we just had one element which had one atom, and we would have its uh, ion, like Ca2+, plus. that's just one element. However, in this case, we're looking at specific polyatomic ions, which will have multiple atoms and multiple elements in most cases, connected together to make an ion. And these, most of these, the ones that are negatively charged, are going to act as nonmetals, and our ammonium right here is going to be positively charged, so it's going to act like a metal. And when they are bonding, with other elements in order to make them stable, they're gonna go through ionic bonding. Therefore, the naming is still going to be very similar. And I decided to include it here with the ionic compounds nomenclature. So let's take a look at some examples of how this works. But before we do that, one thing to know is that when we have polyatomic ions, the IDE ending is removed. So because most of these are going to be non, acting as non-metals, they're going to have other endings, 8, ite, um, more 8, ide, some of them will be ide, but the general ending of ide, re replacing it with whatever's there, is not going to happen. We are just going to keep the name the same of the polyatomic ions. For example, if we have... NaOH. I can identify that the OH is going to be a polyatomic ion, since here it says it's a hydroxide with OH minus. Now I know my sodium has a plus charge, OH minus has a negative charge. So when I'm doing the naming, again, same thing, metal name is sodium. And the hydroxide is going to act like a non-metal, but I'm not going to replace the ending since it already has an IDE. So I will just call it hydroxide. Very simple, since in polyatomic ions, you will just write the name of the polyatomic ion without being worried about IDE. Another example, let's go backwards. We've got magnesium nitrate. So this should be quite simple. Magnesium, we know from the periodic table, is 2+. Plus. And nitrate, if you look at your common polyatomic ions chart, NO3-, minus, that's going to be the formula for that. Now, when the two connect, this is very important here because it creates another tiny little nuance. When these two connect, you see the subscripts? The two is going to go here. But we have a problem because... It's going to be kind of awkward if we place another 2 there. It looks like a 32. So instead, we're going to cover it in brackets and then put a 2, signifying that we have two NO3s. So let's see how that works in a full formula. So we're going to write our magnesium. Now, this has a negative 1 charge, so it'll just be 1 as a subscript. And then we're going to put NO3 in brackets, and then we're going to put a 2 around it signifying that I have two NO3s and one magnesium. Let's do another example. Iron 3 chromate. Now here I know iron 3 will be Fe3+. 
and chromate when I'm looking here it's going to be CrO42 minus so that's right there and when we connect the two the two and the three are going to exchange so I'm going to have Fe2 as the subscript because of the charge of uh, chromate and for chromate I'm going to put it in brackets CrO4 in brackets and the three will go outside of it, indicating that I have three chromates and two irons in this compound of iron three chromate. And finally, let's take a look at our ammonium phosphate. So here I know that uh, ammonium is gonna be NH4 plus, so it's gonna act like a metal. And the phosphate, which is right there, is gonna act like a non-metal since it's negatively charged, PO43 minus. Now when these are exchanging their charges, when we do the crisscross, we end up with NH4 in brackets, three outside of it to indicate we have three NH4s, and we have one PO4. And this will not be in brackets since our subscript is just one. Now if you were to determine how many atoms we have, so let's do that. If I am looking at this, I know that I have three N's, I have 12 hydrogens, I have one phosphorus, and I have four oxygens. How did I know I have three and 12? Well, because I can just take the three and multiply it inside of the bracket, just like you would have done uh, when you are doing simplification in math and you're opening up the brackets. So essentially the three will multiply inside. The subscript of nitrogen is one, and the subscript of hydrogen is four. So three times one is three, three times four is 12 for the hydrogen. Now here we just have the one phosphorus since it's the one subscript uh, and oxygen will have a four subscript, so four oxygens. Now another thing to consider is how we are going to talk about our acids and bases. So bases are going to be simply named normally as our regular inorganic nomenclature that we have done already. However, acids are gonna have special names and here are some rules for naming acids. These blanks are going to signify the non-metal. So here, non-metal, non-metal, non-metal name, and you're going to get your acid. So let's take a look at some examples. If I have HCl, then my inorganic nomenclature name is just going to be hydrogen chloride. However, if I am naming it as an acid, the acid name is going to be hydrochloric acid. As you can see here, we have our chloric, meaning our non-metal that would go right there. We put a hydro in front and we end it with ic acid. Another example, if we have HNO3, this, the name of this is going to have the polyatomic ion uh, with the inorganic nomenclature. And we're gonna have hydrogen nitrate. However, if we are naming it as an acid, this has the ending of eight right here. So the ending of eight is gonna have its non-metal ic acid and the non-metal is going to be nitrate. So nitric acid will be the name. And finally, if we have HClO2, the name of this is going to be hydrogen chloride, chloride right here, ClO2 minus. Now we know that chloride will turn into ous acid. So the non-metal is chlorine. So the name of the acid is going to be chlorous acid. So you can see here we add the OUS acid as the ending. So now that we're done with ionic compounds nomenclature, now let's talk about covalent nomenclature. And I saved this for last because it is really a lot easier than ionic. It does not have uh, nuances really. So what this includes is going to be prefixes. So prefixes are words or parts of words that come before the main word. So what these represent is if you have a subscript of one, you're going to put mono. If you have a subscript of two, you'll put di. If you have a subscript of three, you'll put tri in front of the metal or the non-metal. So the only exception to the rule here 
is that when you are doing your naming, the first element, because covalent uh, bonding is going to be between two nonmetals, but the first nonmetal that will be stated, mono will be excluded. So let's take a look at some examples here. If we have CO2, we know carbon is a nonmetal, oxygen is a nonmetal, and the two combining will make a covalent uh, bond. So the naming of this is going to be just carbon dioxide. And by the way, as you can see, we still keep the ID ending as we do with ionic compounds. And as mentioned, mono is not going to go here in front of the carbon because that's the first element. The first element does not include the prefix of mono. It includes all the other prefixes, but not mono for the first element. So let's take a look at another example here. H2O, water. Now water name is going to be dihydrogen monoxide. Dihydrogen monoxide. So we're going to have mono for the oxygen because it's the second element and we're going to have di for the hydrogen as the first element and this is all based on the subscripts di means the two two hydrogens mono means one oxygen next if we have an o well this is going to be nitrogen monoxide again excluding mono from the nitrogen since it's the first element and finally N2O5 so here we're gonna have di nitrogen pentoxide okay so that's it after learning all of this stuff that we did today you should be able to go ahead and name anything that comes at you from inorganic chemistry congratulations so as always this concludes our lecture for today and watch the next video on main properties of inorganic compounds that would include oxides, hydroxides, acids, and salts.